And here we go. So guys, no, not that. This. So guys, this is the big idea for today. And this is the last of the so what's. So in the previous unit, we talked about the structures of molecules. Uh, increasingly over the last couple days, we've been saying those structures lead to intermolecular forces, lead to everything we had, I think, a very good conversation about as we were grading homework. Guys, today what we're going to do is we're going to make this one last connection. We've already connected intermolecular forces to vapor pressure, volatility, cohesion, adhesion, all of that, so boiling point. We've done that. What we need to do now is we need to tie it to solubility. So guys, when you leave today, the very last thing that we're going to do is we are going to answer the question, why does alcohol dissolve in water, but why does gasoline not dissolve in water? Why does oil not dissolve in water? But then interestingly, why does oil dissolve in gasoline? Why do some things dissolve in some things and others don't? That's going to be our big idea today. So guys, in order to do this, we got to remind ourselves of some things we've talked about before. You guys already know these terms, right? If we're going to talk about dissolving, we're going to talk about solutions. If we're going to talk about solutions, we got to talk about the parts. And guys, solutions always... Okay. So guys, that behind us, there are some more terms that we need to talk about. But for now, guys, what we're going to do is our context is going to be liquid solvents, typically water, dissolving all three phases of solutes, liquid, solids, or gases. So guys, when we talk about this, these are terms that you need to know that you don't know. You need to write these down. I know that typically I have to beg you to not take notes. Guys, this stuff you do need to write down. So when you talk intelligently about solutions and the dissolving process, you need to be able to use these terms. The first one is solvation. So guys, solvation, and I'm going to show you pictures of this in a minute. Actually, you know this. Well, I told you about this last year, right? Where did it go? Did I get rid of it? My students actually last year kept track of how many times we watched the video. I think it was like 14. They actually wrote it and dated it. Um, I must have lost the paper. So guys, solvation uh, refers to the clustering of solvent particles around solute particles. Now guys, if that solvent is water, then we can use the word hydration to mean solvation. So you can almost picture in that video the water molecules surrounding the sodium and chloride ions. That is what solvation looks like. But because the solvent particles are water particles, um, we call that hydration rather than just solvation. So hydration is solvation when the solvent's water. Guys, the next term that you need to know is saturated solution. A saturated solution is a solution into which additional solute will not dissolve. It won't enter the solution, and it remains as a solid. <clears throat> now, guys, that is actually not the technical definition of a saturated solution. But it's probably the one that makes the most sense to you. I want to share with you in a second, when you're done writing, the actual definition of a saturated solution, because if you understand, it's almost poetic. So guys, can you picture a saturated solution? You got a cup of salt, you dump in some salt, stir it, and it dissolves. Add some more salt, stir it, and it dissolves. Add some more salt, stir it, and it doesn't dissolve. 
that means that that, sat that solution is now saturated because you can't get any more salt to dissolve. There's always a limit to how much solid can dissolve in a liquid. Do you know what I'm saying? Okay, so guys, this then is the actual definition of a saturated solution. You ready? Listen carefully. You don't need to write it down, but this is the actual definition. A saturated solution is a solution in contact with its solute. Do you see it? Isn't that fascinating? What does it mean that a solution is in contact with its solute? It can't dissolve anymore because if more of it could dissolve, it wouldn't be in contact with its solute because it would dissolve. So when you get to that point of saturation, no more solute will dissolve. And at that point, the solution can be in contact with its solute. Do you get it? If I had just given you that, it would have made no sense. But guys, that's the idea. So a saturated solution is technically a solution that is in contact with its solute. I think that's pretty cool. Guys, the next term you need to know is this, solubility. We are not going to get to this today. We'll do this on Tuesday. Guys, solubility is the amount of solute needed to form a saturated solution at a given temperature. You're going to see, guys, and actually, I'm going to give you the units. Because this is typically measured in grams per 100 milliliters. So, guys, solubility is the amount of solute needed to form a saturated solution. So, and it is temperature dependent. We'll talk on Tuesday. But guys, for now, you just need to know that you can measure how much salt will dissolve or whatever substance will dissolve in your water. And guys, some of you may remember this. When we did the lab where we did the heats of solution and some of you came to me and said, how much salt can I get away with adding? Who was that? A couple of you did. Do you remember that? And we actually Googled the solubility of your salt and we figured out just how much water you can dissolve in there or how much salt you can dissolve in. You guys know, yeah, anyway. So that's what we were looking up. And then guys, the next two terms that you need to know only apply to liquids dissolving in liquids. So guys, you understand this, right? Um, if you take water and if you dump alcohol in it, it dissolves. What are the intermolecular forces that allow alcohol to dissolve in water? They're not. They're actually hydrogen forces. Guys, alcohols look like this. Alcohols contain an OH group and then some chain of carbons over here. So alcohols um, have a hydrogen bonded to an oxygen. Consequently, they can exhibit strong um, hydrogen forces with water. So alcohol dissolves in water, but here's the trick. You can never saturate a, a mixture of alcohol and water. Basically what happens is, is if you add enough alcohol to the water, then they switch roles and now it's the water dissolving in the alcohol rather than the alcohol dissolving in the water. You can never saturate these solutions. Guys, the name for that is actually what is called miscible. So when we talk about liquids dissolving in liquids, technically we shouldn't say water, I'm sorry, alcohol. Technically we shouldn't say alcohol is soluble in water. We should say alcohol is miscible in water because miscible refers to a system that can never saturate. So miscible means, um, liquids that form solutions in all proportions. So guys, technically, when you've got a liquid dissolving in a liquid, we don't say that it's soluble. We say that it is miscible because you can never saturate it. So guys, what about oil? Does oil dissolve in water? It does not. So how do we then describe liquids that don't dissolve in water and we call those immiscible. These liquids don't dissolve. Um, so immiscible basically means non-soluble if you're talking about liquids and liquids. That would be like oil, gas and water, oil and water, any of those.
Yeah. No. Um, well, we get, we never say always and never, right? Um, so to my limited exposure to this idea, I've never encountered a liquid that you can saturate into another liquid. Doesn't mean there's not. I'm sure there are some really fascinating ideas, but not, not typically. Either it, either it dissolves or it doesn't. And if it does, you can just keep adding and it will always dissolve. You'll never, you'll never get a separation. You'll never get a heterogeneous system, right? Because if when you saturate salt in water, what you do is you're going from something that's homogeneous to something that's heterogeneous because you've got the salt phase and then the salt water phase. Um, and you've got an interface. And that won't happen with liquid in liquid. Okay. You guys good on these ideas? Okay. So let's do this then. Here it comes. Oh, yeah. When an ionic substance such as sodium chloride... Do you just find that voice soothing? No, no. No, as a matter of fact, we hate it. Okay. It is placed in water. Water molecules interact... I'm guessing his voice is pretty silky. ...with the ions on the surface. If the salt is soluble, the attractive interactions with water molecules overcome the ionic attractions within the lattice. The solvated ions move off the surface and become separated in solution. Notice that water molecules... All right, guys, you see it? What words do we use to describe the reality that's on the screen? Solvation, right? Solvation is the surrounding of the solute particle by the solvent particles. So these are examples of solvation. But because the solvent is water, we call it hydration. Do you get the idea? OK, so guys, this is what we're talking about. And eventually, we get to the point where no more of the salt, the solute, will dissolve in the water. And that's what we call saturated. Now, guys, please do not have the misconception that a solution saturates when every single water molecule is engaged in this hydration process. It's not even close to that. Um, it's actually a disappointingly low percentage. Um, but there comes the point where the entropy of the system is such that you just can't get any more to dissolve because there aren't enough water molecules still uninvolved to create this, but please don't think that saturation means every single water molecule is tied up doing this. Okay. Okay. So guys, that are those those are, that is, those are the fundamentals of, of solutions and the ways that we talk about them. So now guys, what we gotta do is we've got to talk about why some things dissolve in other things and why others don't. And guys, in order to do this, we've got to come back and we've got to talk about this energetically. So we're going to talk about this through the lens of, of, of enthalpy, uh, of heat exchange. So guys, the idea becomes this. We're actually going to go back to the video for another second. When an it is placed in water. Okay, so guys, let's use this as our example and let's talk because there's a lot going on here. <coughs> so guys, as this salt dissolves in water, in order to understand why salt dissolves in water, we have got to talk about all of the forces that are breaking and forming as this process takes place. And guys, we can talk about this now through the lens of intermolecular forces. So let's get started. There are three forces here that are at play. There are three forces we need to think about, represented here, that help us understand why things dissolve. What are the forces? What are the forces that are represented in this video? Good. One of them are these, the forces that exist between the ions and the salt. And what type of forces are those? Those are ionic bonds. So guys, these are the ionic bonds 
that exist within the salt. Guys, what other forces do we see represented here? Ion dipole forces. So we've got, I'm going to represent them with the same color, but here we have the solute solvent forces, which are in fact, in this case, ion dipole. So guys, maybe what I'm realizing is I should have said, you're right that these are ionic bonds, This one I think I know how to fix. But guys, rather than just call these ionic bonds, what I'd like, and, and they are, but these are actually, That's not bad. <laughs> Perfect. All right. No one breathe. Okay. So guys, we've got the forces in the solute. They are ion ionic bonds. We've got the forces between the solute and the solvent, ion dipole forces but we're still missing one. Solvent to solvent. We've got the forces within the solvent, which in this case are hydrogen forces, but we've got the forces within the solvent. Now, guys, in, and please be careful with this. In order to understand why some things dissolve in others, we are going to treat these three interactions distinctly. But what we're going to do is number them. And the problem is, is if we number them, you then think that they are ordinal, meaning this goes first, this goes second, this goes third. Guys, we're going to number these, but only as a reference, not as a stepwise process. So with that said, guys, don't miss this. This is the crux of the day. Ready? Guys, we've got forces within the solute, right? Ionic bonds. In order for a solution to form, do those ionic bonds need to break or form? Break. Is that endo or exothermic? Endo. If it's endothermic, what is the sign for delta H, positive or negative? Oh, boy. Doesn't depend. Guys, let's do it again. What has to happen to the intermolecular forces? For, or I'm sorry, what has to happen to the ionic bonds? Form or break? So as they're breaking then, is that endo or exothermic? Right, guys, just anytime you want to break a rock, you got to hit it, right? So that's endothermic. So what then is the sign for delta H? Positive, because you're adding energy. So guys, this is a positive delta H. Now let's look at the next force. The forces within the solvent, in this case the hydrogen forces, do those forces need to break or form to form the solution? They have to break. That is endo or exothermic. Endothermic, we're breaking the hydrogen forces. And if that's endothermic, what's the sign of delta H? Positive. Now guys, looking at this. The ion dipole, the solute solvent forces, the ion dipole forces, do those need to form or break in order to form the solution? Form. So does energy go in or come out? Energy comes out, it's exothermic, and as a result, what's the sign of delta H? Negative. So guys, you ready? This is the big idea for the day. Why does salt dissolve in water? Why does table salt dissolve in water? You ready? Because this is more negative than the sum of these. Got it? That's it. Why does, salt, why does table salt dissolve in water? Because the energy released 
when the solute and solvent get together is greater than the energy that is absorbed by breaking down both of the other forces within the solute and the solvent. Now, understand there's a gray area there, right? We have, you know this from experience. We have salts that dissolve endothermically, like the cold, quick cold pack. Guys, how did we explain that? there's an offsetting change in entropy. But for the conversation that we're having right now, guys, the idea is this. The energy that comes out as the solute and solvent interact is greater than the sum of the energy that's going in to dissociate the solute and dissociate the solvent. Good? Go ahead. So is that reversed for a boiling water? No, it's actually more interesting than that. Yeah, go ahead. No, no, you, you won't. They won't do that to you. So, guys, this then is how we say this. Um, the, I, the, the, this is then the summary of what we just talked about. In order for a solution to form, three things have got to take place. The solute has got to break apart. That's endothermic. The solvent has got to break apart. That's endothermic. Then, guys, the solute solvent interactions have got to form, and that's exothermic. And we can think of this thermodynamically like this. The heat of the solution is the sum of those three processes. <coughs> but again, guys, these are not ordinal. This is one, two, three. This is not first, second, third. Those numbers are references. They are not steps. So all the while the solute's breaking apart, the solvent's breaking apart, and the solute and solvent are coming together. Now guys, for reference, you may find that this is helpful. These two things right here are the endothermic breaking, and this is the exothermic forming of, of, of forces. And as a result then, salts that dissolve, excluding those few that have entropy issues, have negative heats of solution the exo has to be greater than the sum of the endothermic processes. Is that okay? You guys all caught up? No? How about now? Faster, Nathan, faster, more power. Right like the wind, so very old one. What movie is that from? You guys have all seen Three Amigos, right? Where the old woman is sewing together the Three Amigos costumes to try to beat El Wapo, and Chevy Chase comes next, or no, Martin Short comes next to that old woman and goes, so, so like the wind, so very old one. You don't remember. Fibber. Oh yeah. Can I tell you about my shame? I actually am old enough that I first saw Three Amigos in the theater, right? And the opening scene in Three Amigos where they're riding their horses and they hold that note for like two minutes, I walked out. I'm like, this is gonna be a really stupid movie and I left. And no, 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 it's my favorite movie in the whole world. <laughs> I know. You guys good? Okay, so guys, this then is the idea. Do not try to write this down. But this then is the way that this works thermodynamically. So this is enthalpy or heat. And here's the idea. Here's our starting point, solute and solvent. So energy goes in to break the solute apart. Energy goes in to break the solvent apart. And then energy is released as the solute and solvent come together. 
understand that even when we use that, that connecting term then, it's not a sequential process. This doesn't all break apart, this doesn't all break apart, and then they form, but it does allow us to think about energy changes. So guys, notice that the solution has less energy than the starting point, therefore it's exothermic. That bugger is gonna dissolve. Now guys, this can happen another way. Energy in to break the solute, energy in to break the solvent, the, inner, the form. But guys, you'll notice that this is a net endothermic process. The products, the solution, has more energy than the solute and the solute solvent separated. But what is it that then allows those things to dissolve? An increase in entropy. You okay? Okay. So guys, with this as a foundation, we can now do some interesting thinking. So we've got this idea, please don't write this down, but we've got this idea that in order for things to dissolve, the formation of the solute-solvent interactions has got to be more energetic than the breaking down of the other interactions. And up until now, your limited vision for this is simply saying, when water grabs a hold of salt, it gives off so much energy that it's more energy that it takes to break the salt and break the water. So your idea is for things to dissolve, this has got to be huge, which then allows it to be bigger than the breaking processes. But guys, that's not always the way this happens. There's a whole other way that this can happen. This forming of forces between the solute and the solvent can actually be really weak. Don't miss this transition. This forming of these solute-solvent interactions can actually be really weak. It can give off a little bit of energy, and yet those things will still dissolve. But in order for that to happen, what must be true of these still? They're even smaller. So guys, these solute-solvent interactions don't have to be crazy strong. They just have to be crazy stronger than whatever's going on in here. And that's why oil dissolves in gasoline. Guys, the idea is this. Both oil and gasoline are largely nonpolar molecules. Their intermolecular forces are not very strong. So why then does oil dissolve in gasoline? It's not because oil is crazy attracted to gasoline. It's just because oil is attracted to gasoline more than gas is attracted to itself and oil is attracted to itself. So guys, then the question becomes, why does gas not dissolve in water? Why does gas not dissolve in water? Go ahead, Doug. It's not entropy. Why is gas, why does gas not dissolve in water? Be careful with bonds. Intermolecular forces. Yes. So guys, this is the idea. If I'm water, I'm really attracted to other waters. If these two guys are gasoline, they're not very attracted to each other, right? But the thing is, is I'm not attracted enough to them to leave the other water molecules behind. So my attraction, if I'm water, my attraction for oil is not strong enough to get me to leave the other water molecules behind. So guys, this then becomes the idea. Do not write this down. But these are all the possible combinations. It's all about polarity. So here we have the solute, here we have the solvent. Here we've got a very polar substance. I went with salt, could be alcohol or whatever. Then guys, here I went with a non-polar solute like oil. Then for my solvents, I went with water and gasoline. Now guys, this then becomes the idea. Looking at this zone, Looking at our solute, we've got salt, and those are ionic bonds. Those are really strong. What about the forces that exist within the water? Hydrogen forces, really stinking strong. But what about the attraction between the water and the salt? 
really stinking strong. And as a result, this dissolves. Get the idea? Now, guys, what about, I think I went right next. Let me make sure. Yeah, so guys, now what about here? Now look at oil. Guys, what about the attraction between nonpolar oil molecules? Pretty weak, right? They're not polar. Why doesn't oil boil very well? Because the molecules are fat and it's hard for them to leave. But their intermolecular forces are low. Then guys, what about the attraction between water molecules? Really strong. But what about the attraction between the water and the oil? It's weak, it's very weak, because these water molecules can't find anything to grab a hold of because the forces, the intermolecular forces in the oil are London dispersion forces, and they're slopping all over the place, and the water can't find anything to grab. So these are very weak, and that doesn't dissolve. So now, guys, let's go down here. Nonpolar gasoline non, and then polar salt. In polar salt, we've already established ionic bonds, really strong. Guys, what about the nonpolar forces, the, the forces within gasoline? They're weak. Those are also London dispersion forces, not very strong. So what about the attraction then between gasoline and salt? Not very strong. Guys, these gasoline molecules have intermolecular forces only because they're polarizable, and that's not enough to grab a hold of salt. So that doesn't dissolve. So then, guys, what about this? Now we've got a weakly bound solute, oil. Now we've got a weakly bound solvent, gasoline. But when oil and gasoline get together, because of the multiplicative nature of the fact that they're solvating each other, we actually end up with some pretty strongish forces. And they're strong enough to break down these weak forces, and that will dissolve. So now, guys, this becomes the $10,000 question. What's the pattern? That's it. Guys, the pattern is this. Polar things dissolve in polar things, and nonpolar things dissolve in nonpolar things. And we say this, like dissolves like. Now, guys, here's the deal. On the test, you're going to see the question, why does alcohol dissolve in water? And you're going to get all excited, and you're going to go, hey, I know this and you're gonna remember what you're supposed to do, and you're gonna say, all right, I gotta talk about alcohol. Alcohol has a hydrogen bonded to an oxygen, therefore it exhibits hydrogen forces, and then you're gonna, and it's very polar, and then you're gonna talk about water, and water similarly, hydrogen bonded to oxygen, very polar, hydrogen forces. But then when you get the two together, and you're explaining why they dissolve, you're gonna say this, and therefore, alcohol dissolves in water because like dissolves like. And you get no credit whatsoever. Guys, you may use this predictively. You may not use it as an explanation. So what explains why alcohol dissolves in water? And the answer is because the intermolecular forces that exist between, and their hydrogen forces as well, the hydrogen forces that exist between the water and the alcohol are stronger than the sum of the intermolecular forces that exist within the alcohol and within the water. You see how you've got to approach that? That's the game. Like what we did in the boxes. So guys, that's where we're going to stop. Um, this then is your homework. You don't need to worry about that first part. We've already done that. So guys, this then is your homework. Um, but you are nowhere near prepared to do all of this. I uh, know, yeah, you'll find it. You'll, you'll